I'm Andrew. Nice to meet everyone. I lead the customer facing teams here at Knapsac. Uh, we host these webinars on a fairly regular basis, at least monthly, to try to bring together some industry experts, some folks from our team to really touch on some important topics that a lot of teams are trying to work through or, or figure out as they you know, continue or embark on their design system journey uh, as individuals, as teams, as organizations. Uh, today, we have uh, two amazing speakers that are going to really get into it around how do companies and organizations approach buying and investing in design systems. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and, and introduce our panelists today, and then I'll be behind the scenes here answering questions, uh, queuing things up. So please feel free to use uh, the chat, the Q&A uh, right within the Zoom interface, uh, and we'll uh, we'll do our best to get questions answered live or, or type responses. We will have uh, a live time for Q&A at the end of this, so in about uh, 35 minutes or so. Uh, and again, if you have to drop, no worries, we will get the recording out to everyone who registered for this. So our panelists for today are Chris Strahl and Dan Mall. Uh, Chris is the CEO and co-founder of Knapsack, uh, spent a large part of his career in the digital production world, working with teams to, to build and implement design systems at enterprise scale. And now at Knapsack, where we you know, really help teams build out their roadmaps and, and implement the architecture and infrastructure they need uh, to operate systematically at scale in a sustainable way. Uh, Dan Mall. Uh, a, a profound member of the design systems community who has worked in this space uh, in an individual capacity as an agency leader, as a consultant, uh, and is now the founder of Design Systems University, which uh, is up and running after the last couple of weeks. So uh, very, very happy to have you both. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to uh, to Chris to speak through our agenda here, and then uh, then we'll get into it. So first of all, Dan, thanks so much for agreeing to do this. It's always great to collaborate with you. Uh, this will be the, I think, third, maybe fourth time that we've got to have a conversation in front of a mic together. So just really appreciate you. Thanks for coming. Oh, my pleasure. We always have good, fun conversations that are hopefully educational for people listening. So thanks again for the, another opportunity to do it. So diving in, um, kind of a, a five-part plan for today. It follows uh, the buying guide that's up on the Knapsack website. We're going to talk a lot about sort of the, the opener, if you will, which is the considerations and capabilities of a design system software. So why we buy it, how we think about it, what you're really buying, and then moving into the organizational side of it, um, thinking about how you structure an organization for success, how your ecosystem matters um, to the success of your design system. And then we're going to look at cost and maximizing ROI. And um, Dan was very adamant before the program that we, uh, we put real numbers out there. And so we're going to talk about some real case studies and examples of how much people have spent on these things and, and what you should expect there. And then talking a little bit about enablement. So why do we have things like this? The idea that um, a webinar like this is, is a selling tool for Knapsack. It's a selling tool for Dan. But it's also something that is about enablement for you all, taking this to your procurement teams, to your executives, to everybody else inside your organization to help get buy-in and actually make the leap from being interested in a design system to actually buying one. And then we'll have about 15, 20 minutes for questions at the end. So um, one other quick thing before we get started, Andrew, do you want to jump over to the, the next slide? Uh, we are having another webinar June 28th. It's about AI and design systems. Uh, I have been hammered every which way about trying to get a webinar up for this topic. And so uh, really excited to, to jam on this one. Um, please feel free to register uh, now. Um, registration's open. So go ahead and jump in and we'll get you into that conversation as well. We just dropped and the so, registration link in the chat, so everyone should be able to access that. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and stop the slide share, and, and Dan and I are just going to have a jam sesh. So first, just kind of kick us off, you can't really buy a design system. This is, this is one of those things that's a little bit of a, a bait and switch in that you're not ever just like, hey, here's a design system in a box. Uh, I think, what was the metaphor you used, Dan? Did I have a metaphor for it? Oh no! Yeah, it was like you can't buy it like a it was like a hot dog. Oh, right? that's right. You can't you can't buy a design system like you buy a hot dog, right? It's it's just not that straightforward uh, in that way. Um, I, can I can I launch into a story? Can I can Do I it. tell that? All right. So, um, as Andrew mentioned in the intro, I used to run a, a design system consultancy called Super Friendly for a decade, and we would routinely have prospective customers coming to us, and they would be like, "We are ready. We're finally ready to purchase your design system." And we're like, whoa, what? What, what, do you, what do you mean by that? And they're like, we, we are, we, you know, we've, we're ready to, to purchase it. And we're like, oh, we don't, we don't have like a design system like that that you can buy. We're a services consultancy. We will help you make one. We can make one with you, you know, but we don't have that product. And they would go, oh, okay. 
is there anyone out there that we could buy a design system from? And we were like, not really, because like it kind of doesn't work that way. And I think that's the the more interesting part about like what, you know, is you sure you can't buy a design system? That's not interesting. But why can't you? I think that's really interesting. I think that's it's because it's between a couple of things like you don't you don't buy a design system the way that you buy like CRM software. Um, you, you sort of can. But you can't exactly do that. And to me, the the closest metaphor, and again, it's not exactly one to one. The closest thing that I've seen to buying a design system is it, it would be like, we're ready to buy Agile. It's like, well, you can't really buy Agile. Right. You could buy at you can buy software that supports an Agile process. But there's a reason that, that that organizations have to go through Agile transformation, you know, in order to be ready to do Agile and have Agile and then use an ad, you know, use Agile software to support that. So, um, you know, we can get dive into the, the, the depths of that, but I think that's one of the, the, the reasons that you can't really buy a design system is it's, it's as much software as it is process and culture change and team, team modifications and, and all of that kind of stuff. Yes. How, how do you see it, Chris? But well, between the tools, the infrastructure, all the other stuff, there's a lot that has to come together to actually make these projects work and make them successful. And it's why a lot of design systems have a lot of failure to launch, or they end up just being limited to, to engineering component libraries or limited to like really great Figma templates is this idea that um, I'm buying a tool or I'm buying a thing. Well, you're, you're also buying in to a lot of things. You're buying into organizational change management. You're buying into a new way of thinking about working between design, engineering, and product, and, and even content in a lot of cases. So I think the interesting thing, like you said, is, is what are you really buying? And I also like to think about like, when you think about what you're really buying, always couching that in what your company really needs. And when we think about what do you get when you buy a design system from Knapsack, um, you know, when you buy our design system, what you get is you get into tools and infrastructure that are unopinionated in the way that we've constructed them, but are very opinionated when we implement them for a particular customer. And so there's almost always some sort of services component to it, where what we're doing is we're taking a core set of infrastructure and tools that's you know integrated with Git and integrated with Figma and has a really nice workflow system and a really great docs management system. And then we're basically saying like, okay, here's the framework. Now, how do you work and how do we make this software work best for you to try to make it so that the opinionated implementation mirrors as close as possible the communications and the workflows that you already have inside of your enterprise. I think that that kind of contrasts a little bit to, to what you think of in, in the consulting side of things, because there is definitely this idea of, you know, Knapsack tries to take a lot of the bespokeness out of, of design systems, but there is still value in the bespoke. And I, I'd be curious your opinion on that. Uh, I agree that there's value in bespoke. I am biased in that because, you know, running a consultancy in an agency, like that's what we do is we make bespoke things for clients. Um, and there's a productization of that somewhere in there as well. But generally part of the the pitch, you know, from a consultancy or an agency is like, we're going to make you something that is tailored to you, right? It's a difference between going to men's warehouse for a suit or going to a custom tailor to make you a suit, right? Like both are, both can be good suits, depending on what your version of success is. If you're trying to have the most affordable suit that you can, then actually buying one off the shelf is great. If you're trying to have one that fits you really well, then going to a tailor is great. So I think it depends a lot on, on what you want in that scenario. I think one of the things that's challenging about about the idea of buying a design system is I think when people buy software, they expect it to be the end point. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, and, and even when you buy a, a thing from an agency, you know, a, um, you buy deliverable. So you expect an end point. Like you basically are outsourcing the work. You're like, I'm going to put money down so I don't have to spend my time doing this. And I think that that's a little bit different with a consultancy in that I think with consultancy, a lot of uh, companies are like, well, we are buying a starting point, right? We are buying you to help us set something up that we will have to continue. And that's one of the things, you know, design systems, I think uh, common language recently about around design systems is that design systems are practices. So it's it's a thing that you start and you have to keep going for a while. It's, it's not a thing that's like, we solve the problem by just buying one, you know? And I think a lot of folks come into the idea of like, can we solve this problem by buying a thing? And, you know, I think one of the reasons that's challenging is because I, I can't think of actually a, a, a similar analog, but it's one of the only things that I can think of that is a potential solution for a design plus engineering plus product team. 
And there's not a lot of, most tools that you buy, most software that you buy is like for the sales team or for the engineering team or for the design team or for like, it's within one discipline or one silo. There's actually not a lot of precedent for like, this solves, this potentially solves three teams problem, but it also requires all three teams or three disciplines to come together in a shared approach, you know, for a shared solution. So I think that's one of the challenges in that for sure. No. And so when we were a consultancy, because for anybody that doesn't know, we were a consultancy called Basalt before we were a, a design system SaaS company called Knapsack. When we were Basalt, that was one of the things that we realized when we were constructing Knapsack, that the, the core tenet of the tool is it has to have um, the ability to serve more than one discipline. And so if you can't just, or if, you're, if you're only serving one discipline, you're only really solving a part of the problem. And that sort of systematic approach is innately democratized and it's innately cross-functional. And that need to basically say, look, it's not just about design. It's not just about engineering. It's not just about docs. It's not just about code. It's about the ecosystem and the way of working. That was a big epiphany moment for us. And now I'm not talking about about super friendly in your work, but I've definitely seen a lot of agencies come in and do the, the like $5 haircut version of a design system where they go and they do something for like just one particular discipline. And like, it sets them up with a component library or it sets them up with something else. And then the idea of, of knapsack is, is like we fix the $5 haircut a lot in, in the case of, of these systems where we'll actually talk about like the more integrated ways of working. And so I guess my point there is like, don't buy a $5 haircut from an agency that's promising to solve all your problems. Go ahead and think about like this more holistically and systematically, even if that doesn't include nips, knapsack. And I think that's a good segue into the, like, what do you actually need? Right. Um, you know, at knapsack, we're, we're about big enterprise. We do big enterprise design systems. Some of the biggest companies in the world run their design systems on Knapsack. Now, you know, does that mean you couldn't get any use out of Knapsack being a, a, a small company? Well, yeah, you might be able to get value from it. But there's lots of other solutions that are out there that do a part of what we do that you should probably buy before you start to think about us. And it's not just about organizational size. There's there's a lot about it in terms of, of complexity and fit. Um, I think that there's an interesting conversation to have around the idea of like, what do you really need as, as an organization looking to adopt a design system? And a lot of that conversation in my mind is based on what you already have. Do you already have a component library? Do you already have well-structured design files? Do you already have the ability to take something from design to code in a fairly meaningful way so that the thing that you design looks a lot like the thing you coded? Um, if you can do all those things, like generally you're a really good fit for a tool like ours, because what we can do is we can accelerate that process. We can wrap it in workflow and we can make it so that it's something that you can control and, and feel like you have your arms around. If you don't have those things, it becomes a little bit more of a, a nuanced conversation around this idea of, of like, okay, so, so where is the breakdown happening? Like, where is the fall off between design and engineering? Is it that they're in different countries? Is it that they don't talk to each other? Is it that they don't have a common idea of names or workflows. Now we can oftentimes help solve those problems too, but it's a very different starting point in the conversation around what do you actually need as a company and are we the right product for you? And I, I'm sure that you go through something similar to this on, on the, the consulting side of things where you kind of look at like, what is the maturity of this organization and are they really ready for an engagement? No doubt. Uh, the in this in our sales cycle, one of the things that we used to do is we used to try to actively talk people out of hiring us, and that wasn't some like weird sales tactic that like uh, like um, you know people Nine, want what they right? can't like, have. You know, it was no, it wasn't any of that. It was like it was really like we wanted our clients to to get value for the money that they spent. So one of the questions we would ask them a lot, and this used to happen early in our sales process, where clients would come to us and we and they would go like, we think we need to buy a design system, but like can we just use material design? Like what, like, can you tell us why we shouldn't just use material design or bootstrap or, you know, any of the open source design system? So we started to adopt that as part of our sales process where we would just ask clients that first, you know, sometimes before they've even thought of that, that question and much less the answer, we would go, what's stopping you right now from using material design? Because that is a great design system. It's been worked on for many, many years. Um, it's worked on by really smart people, you know, so like there are design systems that are open source and even more now than, than then when, when I was selling design systems to folks. So like, why can't you use one of those things? What are the blockers? And it goes to what you were saying, Chris, that sometimes it's just, they have too much in place already to, to do that. Sometimes they don't have enough in place to be able to adopt that. And so one of the things that, that I would often say to folks is, and this goes back to your, your question about like, is there value in bespoke versus off the shelf? 
because I think that's that's the other route too, right? One is if there's if the two ends of the spectrum are you know you can buy it right off the shelf or you know that 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 becomes tailored to your needs, and on the other side, it's you can create but bespoke bespoke from scratch. Somewhere in the middle is like we can find an open source one, right? And mm -hmm. we can use that as a starting point, and and so and that is a viable route for a lot of teams. So what I ended up saying to a lot of folks is that. If you want your design system to last more than three years, bespoke is a better investment. If you if, if you're a startup and you need to get up and running, by all means, use material design or chakra or ant design or you know, whatever open source React tools or Angular tools or whatever that are out there, because they give you a starting point. But around that two to three year mark is usually when I see a lot of teams going like, we're now fighting the system. We're now taking stuff, more stuff out of it than we are actually using it. And then, and they, and so it starts to become a hindrance around that time. So if you think you're going to refactor in two or three years, go ahead, go for it. Like use something off the shelf, let it get, you know, whatever, whatever you're looking for product market fit or an MVP or any of those terms. Um, but, but bespoke is a, is a much better way to go or buying something off the shelf that can be customized, you know, that, that, that you offload the support to, you know, those are better solutions if you want your design system to last for a long time, which I would imagine and propose that most design systems should last for a, a long time, unless you really are seeing it as like, this is just a stopgap measure right now. We just need something to plug a hole. And we know we're going to come back and revisit that later, which I don't think is a, is a bad concept either. It's interesting because there's, I tend to separate these concepts a little bit where you think about things like ant and material and chakra as like content in a design system. And then there's like the infrastructure and the tooling for a design system. And that's kind of what Knapsack does. And so when you think about the idea of that content, what's been really fascinating is, is I think things like carbon and material and, and all those other content systems that are out there are a little less meaningful for folks that already have established component libraries and, and things like that, right? And those are more and more common. Very few people are starting from scratch and also very few people are willing to sort of throw away the work they've already done building their digital products and replace that with some other sort of system. And of course you have the problems you described about like, hey, this is either too little for me and I need to build a bunch of stuff on top of it or it's too heavy for me and I need to rip a bunch of things out of it. Um, really similar to to like the Twitter bootstrap conversation of, you know, five, six years ago. Um, and so when you think about that, I try to separate those concepts because there is a lot of value, I think, in the bespoke creation of content within systems. And that to me makes a ton of sense. What I think there is a lot less value in, and, and I mean, we started a company on this, so obviously I'm biased as well, right? Is the idea of like, you shouldn't have to stand up all your tooling in your infrastructure. You shouldn't have to write your own like, Git connector that connects to a React app that displays, you know, in uh, uh, like standard your Gatsby or whatever sort of content framework system, what your documentation looks like. Shouldn't have to write your own renderer that can manage React and Angular and Vue and web components and AEM and Sitecore all in the same place. Like, let us do all that work. And that's kind of where we provide the core value is like, we're very unopinionated about what goes into our system, but we are pretty opinionated that you need two things to have a successful design system at enterprise scale, you need to wrap it in a workflow that everybody trusts and get did a really good job of solving that for us. Even if, even if you're a designer and you don't really know what, like how Git works, like it's great and you can put it in a UI and that's what Knapsack has kind of done. And then the second side of it is structured data. Like if you don't have the idea of how structured data works inside your system, your system can get that sort of spaghetti, you know, uh, feel to it. Um, and we worked with a, a a lot of customers in our very early days that would have thousands of components. And the reason why they would have thousands of components is every variant of a component was a new component because they had no idea how to structure their data to make it so that was all props and slots and design tokens. They thought about everything as its own unique variant, as its own unique component. Um, so anyway, that, that's like my ramble about, about the idea of tooling and infrastructure and then content. And they're not totally separate, but I think that there is a value in thinking about those things a little bit independently when making that evaluation. Yeah, I totally agree with that. The You asked earlier about like, there's like a maturity thing that gets assessed with an organization of like, well, you know, what, is, what do they need? And that's often tied, maybe not one-to-one, -one, but related to how mature they are in a lot of different ways. Like how mature is a design discipline or an engineering discipline, regardless of systems or design systems or anything like that. And then how mature is their collaboration and, and all of that kind of stuff.
And there are words, I think, that, that give that stuff away. You know, like when, when we would get a, a client coming in, a prospective client coming in, and the words that they would use are around APIs and components and things like that, like that leads us in one direction. Okay, it seems like they need this or this is where they are, you know, and what, what would enable the next step. Whereas there are other, um, we, you know, we've worked with other clients who, like you said, I think the... I think for the most part, the battle is won in, you know, creating design systems for companies, but even we almost all of our clients toward the end of super friendly was clients coming in saying, we already have this design system. We've, we've had it for, for five years, but like, no one seems to use it. And we don't really have like a governance process down. And like, we want people to contribute to it, but we have no idea how to even get people to want to do that. You know, so how, how do we do? And so that indicates like a different level of maturity. And it indicates an organization that's like, we haven't solved the workflow part of that. And so, you know, for me, whenever I'm teaching design systems, like similar to you, there are, there are two things that I, I teach. The first thing is, um, is piloting, which is how do you create, how do you evolve your design system in the context of your product work? Right. Yep. And then the second thing is workflow, you know, like is just rejiggering collaboration workflow or sometimes just rewriting it from scratch because a lot of organizations haven't really haven't truly figured out how design and engineering and product can collaborate. Right. They have a they have an artificial version of collaboration, which is like, you know, we 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 do a thing over here in design in Figma or Sketch or whatever, and then we replicate it in code and then we have like design QA and then we have like shared critiques. Like, well, that's not really, that's not really working on the same thing at the same time, you know, with folks, which is what collaboration is. It's, it's, it's decoupling those things. And the point about systems is actually connecting things, not decoupling them. And so, you know, that's a lot of what I think organizations need, especially more and more nowadays is like the, I think the battle is won. And you're like, can you stand up a bunch of components really quickly? Like, yeah, sure. But that doesn't mean that people are going to use them, you know? And so I think that that's the customization part and the, the architecture part. That's like, it's not about the components. It's not about the, it's, it's, it's not about um, those things as an end point. Again, back to our, back to a point that we made earlier. It's not about those things as an end, but I think one of the challenges is that people on teams work on them as if they are an end. Like I, you know, I see designers and engineers in particular working very hard on like, ah, oh, once we get these components out, we'll be done. It'll be like it'll be good, and it's like oh no no that's the that's the start. <laughs> Once you finish that, that's when you start working on the design system. And they're like, wait what? And it's because I think a lot of our work is just so heads down. In that like once we build this connector, this design, the custom design token parser, then we will enable collaboration. It's like I I don't think so. I've never seen it work like that. So I think totally. a part of that is just is just incorporating the workflow, you know, and, and, in all of this, like, and, and helping to solve that problem in addition to the tooling and the, and the content part. Yeah. And I think that there's a part of that too, that is like given some measure of paralysis around not knowing what to do, I'm going to go do the thing that I'm passionate about doing. And I feel like I can control and do. Absolutely. Um, I've seen some incredibly hacked up storybook implementations in my life that are, um, these sort of Frankenstein monsters to go try and, and, you know, build a capability that fundamentally like should exist outside of that tool. And I think that it's interesting when you, you look at those sort of implementations and say, okay, um, you know, what, what was your ultimate goal here? Like, what were you trying to achieve? And really kind of started that, that first principle level, uh, like you were talking about around like where, you know, where's your maturity at. And you got into a really interesting sort of, of part of that conversation, right? Where, you know, you can spend a bunch of time in the design land, really creating this beautifully organized set of Figma files that ultimately will never make it into production. Or you can spend a bunch of time in, in code land, making a bunch of really great abstract components that no product team ever actually implements and uses. And so the problems are kind of the same between these disciplines. And what it's really about, in my opinion, is making it so that that intention that is captured in design actually shows up in your end product and code. And that is that measure of success that I think everybody is trying for so hard in this. We just have people that go about it in, in ways that don't either work for their environment or they think about it in sort of traditional models where there's this wall where like design stops and coding starts. And I think that one of the interesting measures of maturity that we use a lot at Knapsack is actually the words design system itself. I rail against how much I hate the word design being in design systems on the podcast all the freaking time. But one of the things that is really interesting is I know a prospective customer gets it when they also say that they hate the word design systems because it inhibits their ability to get budget or to get things done inside of the organization. 
you get a lot of people that come to us, they're like, I just want better docs, or I just want the ability to organize things, or I want to create a reference site that is an aspirational thing that, that our team should, should strive for. And almost all the time when we have those conversations, I say like, go buy our competitors. Um, because the idea is, is like, we're not there to build like a North Star site or a lighthouse or to just make it so that it's easier for you to document your system. We're there to actually make it so the things that you're making and design are have a direct tie to a published product somewhere in your ecosystem. And that to me is like the real true like metric that we should all be looking for is how much of the stuff that I'm working on in that world of design and intention makes it into the world of implementation and customer land. How do you, so it's fascinating. How do you measure that, right? Cause like it's already hard to measure the baseline stuff, which is like, how many people are using our components, right? That seems like table stakes, but even that's hard. And like only now are we seeing tooling around that stuff kind of come out and, and be helpful. But I think it's really early in those days still, even though there's been a problem that existed for you know a decade at least, you know, if not more. So how do you do that in general? And then I'm curious about your perspective, like from a, a company that has a product that people purchase, how do you do that from that perspective as well? Right. So we think about this in terms of uh, like we provide a ton of analytics data about use of our product, right? So like how many how many content blocks did you create? How many components do you have? How many variants of those components do you have? We call them like uh, examples in our system. And so like how many examples have you created? How many variants? Where do those variants live in documentation? How many of those variants are reused across your various pages? How many design tokens do you have? Um, you know, all those sorts of things. And we do that between workspaces because oftentimes there's systems of systems approaches where people have a foundational workspace and then they have a brand workspace. Um, or a group workspace. And so that data is very highly objective data about like, this is how people use and browse and create inside of the design system. And that is helpful because that at least shows that people are using the system. Now, use of the system and it actually showing up in product are a bit different. And this is where you have to take subjective metrics and make them into objective metrics. And so what we always recommend is that people survey their teams and they ask their teams like, as a designer, do you feel like the work that you do is represented in our end facing user products? And you give them a, a scale, like a very simple, like NPS style metric associated with that. And you survey them across your entire design team. You do a similar thing for engineers. And what you're able to do is you're able to take that, that subjectivity of like, hey, it feels like my work is better represented than it ever has been and turn that into an objective metric of success for your design system. And you can do that also around pain. Um, a lot of design systems are about solving pain, right? It sucks to have like the devil's tennis match of design QA and engineering QA of like, move this three pixels to the left or like, hey, this looks terrible in, you know, IE 11 or something like that, right? The, the battle that exists or has traditionally existed between design and engineering of who owns fidelity is very painful inside of most organizations. And so if you're able to survey people like, how smooth is your process for delivery of product? And you're able to watch that get smoother, like that's better than just a, a line go up metric, right? That's not just a vanity metric. That's something that basically says like real change is happening because the talented created people you've hired feel like their job is easier and feel like it's better. I know we had a, a portion of this uh, of this conversation to be about like, how, how do you assess an organization? Like, how do you know where they are in that maturity cycle and all that? And uh, in we had a product called the Design System Diagnostic. And in our diagnostic, one of the things that we require to do the diagnostic is give us access to all the design system and design system related things, right, that you've got. So that could be like, Figma files, sketch libraries, uh, GitHub repositories, Bitbucket repository, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And so generally the first set of things that we would get is like, okay, here's our design system repo and here's our, you know, our storybook and all this stuff. And, and we're like, cool, this is great. We also want access to at least 10 or so, or however, however many you can manage products so that we can look through those products and go, okay, there's an import for that component that's tied to this thing. Like we can just look at the dependencies and see how connected the design system is. But like to your point, because we want to know that design system isn't just a, a storybook repo somewhere, but it's actually making its way into some of those end products. 
And this is not part of the assessment itself. It's like, this is not part of the score that we used to put, but it, it was an indicator. Just how hard it was to get access to those things is already an indicator of like, okay, so it's not that smooth. The process of going from design system to product is actually not that smooth. And we can even tell just from the, the things that people send us, some people would send us like, here's our, here's a reference website. You know, it's like, okay, cool. Some people would say, okay, like, let me compile a care package for you. And we're like, oh, you know, and the care package <laughs> would be, you know, 30 repos and 12 Google docs. And oh, we don't have access to that Google doc. Oh, that one's in Confluence. And okay, no, but we got to get you access to, con oh, but we have to send you a computer so that you could log in through the VPN, but it has to be through one of our, like all of that stuff. It just indicates the amount of friction that people are going to have using the design system. You know, so e from an assessment standpoint, even that step alone, alone is like, okay, there's work to do. You know, there's work to do here in how smooth that workflow can be. And of course, we're not, we, we don't, we didn't say like, just because we are having a hard time having access to it doesn't mean that your employees do, but it's an indicator that a new employee might, right? So a new engineer right. on the team or a new designer on the team, Agency partner, they got it. Yeah, exactly. They got to wait six weeks to be able to get access to this thing because their login isn't approved by it. Like that's actually a blocker to having a smooth design. System. And if you clear that up for an agency partner, if you clear that up for, um, you know, for a third party, then you potentially clear that up for a new employee or a new hire or someone on the team that you expect to, ha to know these things and have access to these things, but actually don't. So even before getting into the assessment itself, like even just access to the, to the files or access to the design system itself is a good indicator as to how smooth that workflow can be. Yeah. We look at it in kind of a similar way. Um, slightly different, but, but very similar in, in context. And so we, we think about how much do people want to have a way of working that they're buying versus having like a, a tool that they're buying? And, and to put a little bit finer point on that, the idea of, of where do your constraints come from? Do your constraints come from your tool and you want to use the tool to enforce those constraints? Or do your constraints come from the process and the way that you think about building inside of your organization? We're a pretty unconstrained tool. You can do a lot with Mapsack, a lot of things that you maybe shouldn't be able to, like create grids of heroes or something like that, right? Um, we don't offer those as constraints very, very deeply in the system because we want to be able to work for a whole wide variety of people. We want people to, to think about their constraints as their own process constraints or their own ideas of, of their workflow constraints inside their organization. And yes, that's environmental. Yes, that's about service models. That's about ways of working inside the company. But people that have those things kind of figured out, or at least know that they don't have them figured out, those are the best kind of customers for us because they're not looking for a tool to tell them how to work. And I think that that's um, kind of a trap where people will look at, at tools and they'll basically say like, oh, this gives me a way of working. Well, it does until the moment that you hit that constraint wall and you can't break through it and you can't get past it. Um, and I think that that's a really interesting problem with a lot of the the kind of tooling in, in this space and lots of, especially like no, low code, no code tools is those things were great to stand something up that gets you 60 or 80% of the way there. But when you all of a sudden have that one thing that you absolutely have to have in production and you can't do it, that whole tooling system just kind of falls down. And so thinking about where your constraints come from is actually a really important aspect of picking out one of these systems. Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm torn about this um, because in one sense I totally agree with you that like especially when you're setting up a design system or even you know even outside of design systems designing something for the first time like you don't know what the system is yet so you want ultimate freedom you don't want constraints there because it's artificial the, the constraints are artificial to you um, on the other side of that though there are times where and, you know, I've done I've done talks about this before where I would kill for a tool that is constrained that like that forces me into like I I, I did a talk once where I, uh, years ago when sketch had first come out that like I wish I couldn't type a number in in any of the position boxes or anything in the panel i wish it could just it would just let me snap to eight point increments if i'm working with an eight point grid like don't let me put you know the number 62 in there because it's not divisible by eight like it's 56 or 64 that's what you know that's what i want font size like all that like i that constraint helps and i think I'm, I'm reminded of this i think it's a marshall McLuhan quote that like first we shape our tools and then our tools shape shape us right, right. and like and i think it's that and i think that's that is a workflow that I think a lot of a lot of practitioners crave, which is like, yes, I want to be able to define the system, and then I want to be able to use it really smoothly without worrying about any, any of the other stuff. I think that's part of the the promise of a, of a design system. So, like the 
I think it, the the questions about where those constraints come in and when they come in, right? Because if they come in at the wrong time, then you can't do what you're actually supposed to do, and that becomes a problem. If they come in at the right time, then you're actually free from the decision making of ah, why do I have to pick one of 16 million colors? I just need to use the eight that are in our palette, like one of those eight. And that's really freeing. It saves, it, like that's where we get the benefits of what people talk about with design systems of efficiency and consistency. You know, it's much easier to make it consistent if I only have eight colors to choose from than it is if I have 16 million colors to choose from, you know, the, the entire spectrum. So I think like where those, when those constraints come in is an important question that I don't see a lot of teams asking very much. Yeah, and I think this is why we pair most knapsack implementations with consulting, right? Is is the idea of like, yeah, absolutely a knapsack. You can create an eight color palette and you can make sure that nobody can deviate from that. But there's somebody that has to set up that eight color palette. Yes. And there's somebody that has to like decide what that constraint is going to be. And that's where the rub really is in this, is this idea of like, who makes that decision? Does that software make your decision for you? Or do you make that decision and then set up your software in a way that that's a constraint for everybody else? Yeah, I think where and, we're aligned on that for sure is that we, I think we both believe that software should not make that constraint for you. That should come from the team and, and the organization. So I do want to get into the, the sort of spicy idea of like how much should this stuff cost, right? So this is, by the way, I love that you brought this up in sort of the pre-conversation about like, hey, like, you know, the thing that, what was it you say? You like, the thing I like about you guys is you guys are willing to talk numbers, something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yep. I mean, like the fact that you have an ROI guide on the site, our cal ROI calculator on the site and a, and a design system buying guide is like, I, I think that like one of the most common requests that we would get is like, can you help us do H2 planning? You know, and and it's not not necessarily about roadmap items or or things that we want to ship. Like most of most of that stuff can be done internally, but most of the time people are like, we have no idea how much this stuff should cost, and it doesn't have to be like, all right, it will be you know six hundred thousand four hundred thirty six dollars and eighty two cents. Like it doesn't have to be to that level, but just like, are we talking a thousand dollars or a hundred thousand dollars? That's a big difference in when it comes to planning, when it comes to forecasting, and so I think that's an important part of this conversation that we could. You know, we could talk abstractly all day about this stuff because it's fun and exciting and, you know, fun to pontificate and all that. But I think at the end of the day, some people have to go away from this webinar or from their H2 planning and all that stuff and go, all right, yeah, we budgeted about $550,000 for this, right? And know that that's like in the ballpark, you know, right, right. give or take, you know, X amount of dollars. So that's what, that's part of the reason that I was excited to do this webinar is like, let's, let's give people some numbers and go like, this is generally the ballparks that we've seen and all this. And I'm, I'm happy to take a first crack unless you want to take a first crack. Well, so is is this the point where we like we both write something down on a sticky note and we like slide it across the table? Uh, I, I hate that stuff. Um, I'm a, I, I wrote a pricing book, so I've got some opinions about this. Um, I like anchoring. I like being the first number, you know, the reveal because everything anchors off of that. So when people ask right anchors out of the away. gate without any contact, what's that? Anchors away. Okay, cool. So when when people ask about it, you know, just to get us started, how much should a design system cost? Like, and without knowing anything else, I'm generally I generally say a million dollars, a million dollars a year, and and so then, and then the follow-up question is like, okay, like, what do we spend that million dollars on? Which I think is a, is a great question. So what I mean by a million dollars a year generally looks like building up to an eight-person design system team, a dedicated eight-person design system team. And those eight people are um, a combination of, so probably a design system product manager. Oh, sorry, let me back up for a sec. Most of your expense with a design system, at least at first, or at least in the first couple of years, I think is going to come from the staff that's supporting it. So most of the money is going to go to salaries and supporting people who can at least 75% of the time, if not 100% of the time, work on the design system. Not like, oh yeah, I'm on a product team. And then I could, you know, I spent some side time doing, doing design, like not that, that's not working on it dedicated. So a dedicated design system team, um, I think most of the money, the budget allocated is going to go to salaries. So that looks like a product owner for the team probably one or two designers, one or two engineers, probably a producer uh, or a design ops person. Um, and then eventually, uh, and hopefully as early as possible, a content designer or a writer, um, a business analyst or a strategist, you know, something like that. And so the, the, the big point that I want to make, it's not specifically about those roles, but the big point that I want to make is whatever your typical product team looks like, your design system team should look like your typical product team, yes. cross-disciplinary product team. So whatever, if your cross-disciplinary product team is five people, whatever those five roles are, that's what your design system team should have. Because that's a signal that you're treating your design system like a product. You know, it has to be 
staffed, it has to be budgeted, it has to be supported, and it has to be allocated, and people have to have roadmaps, you know, to be, and so that team, if they're able to do that on any feature that your company produces, well, they should be able to do that for a design system too. And so most of that, you know, using sort of US uh, salaries, you know, average US salaries is going to equate to about 600 to $800,000 a year. And then to me, the extra 200,000 in there, 100 to 200,000 in there to get to a million is probably some amount of training as well as licenses to software that you might need to support that team, right? Now, obviously there's way more variables than that, but as a starting point, I've seen that be a good, a good starting point. One last thing that I'll mention about that is I'm not suggesting that out of the gate, you ask for a million dollars from leadership and you build an eight person team from scratch. Usually an eight person team, takes three to four years to build up to, you know, starting with usually where design systems start one or two designers or one or two engineers, like, you know, or a designer and engineer kind of like jamming away on some components and then supporting them with some management or hierarchy structure and then supporting them with some project management or design ops, you know, and it's kind of supporting and supporting and supporting outside of that as things need to be created. So, so the takeaway I think is not you know, not eight people out of the gate, not a million dollars out of the gate, but eventually, you know, working up to about that. I find that that's a helpful starting point for folks. It's pretty darn close to, to the same math we have. We think about that as, as pretty close to our floor, right? Like that's, that's about like the, the minimum size that, that works really well with Knapsack. And we usually also think about that first year spend being a little bit bigger than ongoing spend. And that first year spend is usually augmented by um, uh, agency partners or contract developers that help with content. Um, oftentimes there's a lot of like infrastructure setup that takes additional time from DevOps or from other parts of the organization that um, isn't well thought out, especially if you you have a fairly complicated um, like central repository to product repository workflow. Um, you know, you need things like SSO and security and stuff like that. You have to go through on those audits. And so very often that first year cost is a little bit outsized by as much as 50% to basically think about um, uh, all of those additional considerations to get that system and infrastructure sort of stood up. Um, we tend to think about it in a, a similar vein of, of out your spend is, is one to 2 million. Uh, first year spend is two to 3 million. And when we think about it like that, um, you know, similar size team, again, uh, uh, we often think if, if we were to add on to that team that you had, we think about actually placing people in product in, in key areas. So if you have a key product that is essential to the success of the design system, so like your you know, flagship website or something like that, um, usually you want to have one of those people uh, doing evangelism work into that as a job. And that is about like helping those people, training those people, answering those people's questions, being support and like account management for your internal customer. Um especially if there's there's critical folks. Sometimes that's a shared role among um, a couple of different properties or features. Um, sometimes that's a dedicated role, depending on the importance of that, that site. Um, and then there's also the idea of, of doing a rotation where you usually try to bring two or three folks in on rotation where you adopt their budget into your part of your org for three or six months. And that helps get familiarity and training with the design system. Um, all the most successful customers that we have have done some form of that where they bring people from that end product into the design system team to have them contribute to the design system and feel that ownership of a part of that. And then I think that, you know, just bumping the team size by like one more increment, more mature, robust teams that are doing rollout. Sometimes they have, you know, a 15 person team instead of an eight person team. And somewhere in that is, is about the right size. I think that you know, the biggest uh, uh, like common un, unrotating team that we have is about 30 people. Um, and so the smallest is I think about seven. And so so that's kind of the, the direction that we had. We also think about software spend in a similar vein where, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're buying Knapsack for that, um, you know, team that Dan described where you're spending about a million dollars, you're spending about a hundred grand on Knapsack. Um, and we're sort of your, your sixth man in that. And that we make everybody about, you know, 10, 15, maybe 20% faster. Um, and then if you're in that larger space, you're probably more at like a quarter million to, to half a million dollars with Knapsack. Um, and it kind of all depends on, on your organizational need, but that's at least a nice range or ballpark. I love it. We did it. We talked numbers. There. And, and now you guys have them. You can, you can, you can take that back and be like, I need a million dollars. No, but seriously, like this is actually, you have a really good segue on this about how you go from 
spending 20 or $50,000 with a consultancy, making an assessment to actually getting this in front of a, a procurement person and, and having the chance of signing a contract. Um, on in general at super friendly our million to $2 million contracts, design system contracts with companies took about 18 months in sales. So that's the downside to asking for a million bucks. So you might get it, but it might take you a year and a half to get it. And there, anything can happen in a year and a half. So that's, that's partly why, you know, what we just talked about is like, it overall might cost this, but asking for it up front, there might be better strategies than, than that, than going like, all right, let's, you know, can you, can you allocate a million dollars to us to, to be able to do this? And there's a lot of factors in that. You know, most teams don't know how to sell internally a design system without it being a cost center or without framing it as like, it's an investment in a tool that we have that makes us more efficient. Well, okay, well, if it's that, then by the time we get this set up, let's lay off half of our staff. Are we cool with that? And we're like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. No, not that. So it's a hard sales pitch to go in and ask for a big, large amount instead of, and so what, what we learned in, on the sales, on the agency side, you know, that I think works equally well on the in-house side is exactly what you're saying, Chris, you tie it to something that's already going on and also a smaller chunk of that. And if you can, and so this is the thing related to, to what you're saying earlier. I also suggest to teams all the time, like, don't, don't say the word design. You're not asking for a million dollars for a design system. You're asking for twenty thousand dollars or sixty thousand dollars to do a pilot to get your platform migration underway, like that. And 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 it's it's not about sleight of hand, and it's not about you know baiting and switching or anything like that. It's about tying what you're doing, tie, like because a design system is supposed to help something that you're doing. It is not an end goal to its to itself. So having a design system helps you ship product faster or helps you, uh, you know, do something that you need some outcome. So you tie it to that outcome. You know, if in this year we are we're migrating a whole platform from .NET to React, well, great. The design system can help with that. So can we get sixty grand in six weeks to put a small team on it? to see what we can do in that amount of time. And then if we can prove some traction there, then you give us another 120 next quarter to be able to do a little bit of a bigger piece. Um, and so, you know, ultimately over, over a year, you might spend a million bucks, but do it quarter by quarter, you know, over, over multiple years, you might spend 5 million bucks, but you're doing it year to year tied with your planning, tied with your organizational goals. Um, so I, we've had much more success doing it that way than an outright spend. You can get the outright spend, but I just find that the, the amount of time that it takes to get there, so many things may have changed in that. So you'll have to revisit your pitch every quarter and it just restarts that process over and over again. So definitely doing it piecemeal, um, I think is a better way to just get buy-in in general on design systems is that create traction first. You know, sometimes even without budget, just show that you can do something in six days. And then you can go to your leadership and say, look what we did in six days. What if you gave us 12? You know, look what we did in six months. Look what if you gave us 12? Um, and that pitch, I think, plays a lot better than I've got this idea for something really cool. Can I have a million bucks for it? Right. Which is oftentimes what a design system pitch comes off as. Totally. And it's interesting because we come in a little later than that. Usually, like usually the people have proven out some level of value of systems thinking inside of the organization. They've had that 20 or a hundred thousand dollars spend. And now they're starting to look at like, what's that next step? And how do we introduce something that is more systematic, but we use a really similar tactic. And that's actually a big qualification metric for us is like, are people willing to sit down and hash out what the next six to 12 months looks like and what their organizational KPIs and metrics and goals are for that. And to have those be things that are, are realistically attainable and achievable, achievable inside of that, that time frame. And the people that are willing to sit down with us and map that out, first of all, it gives us an insight to their thinking and how far they've come with, with systems already inside of their organization. Um, but then it also gives us a, a roadmap effectively to look at. And, you know, like it's a little burn downy, you know, waterfall or whatever, right? But it gives you an idea of like the major milestones that you have to hit over the next six or 12 months to get to, uh, uh, you know, design system implementation that that's really what they want. And very often in that process, we say like, look, at, you need six more months of doing this yourself and then go engage us here and, and come back to me when you've hit this point in, in the map that we've laid out for you, because that's the point that we can actually be valuable. But for where you're at right now, like, like go talk to Dan or, or something like that. Right. Um, and so we very often do that as a part of our, our process is to basically lay out what are your milestones? What are you looking to get to? And like, where can we actually be valuable? Because the last thing I want to do as a CEO of this company is sell something to somebody that, that isn't ready and then has a bad experience. Um, 
And so we try to be really adamant about making sure that it's it's the right point in the process. Love it. I love it. A- any final thoughts, Dan? I want to make sure that we have some time for Q&A. Um, and also just want to say thank you so much again for being on. I really appreciate you giving your time and being so generous. And Yeah, my pleasure. This is just fun. As always. Uh, no, no final thoughts from me, but I see some good questions in the chat already that, that, uh, that, yeah, let's get to those. Awesome. Let's get right into that. One quick last shameless plug. Again, we have another webinar coming up in just about a month's time. So please, if you're interested in how this whole crazy explosion of AI is going to impact the design system world, uh, go ahead and register. I'll drop another link in the chat. Uh, but in the meantime, um, I think we have a, a couple of great questions. I'd love to start with the question from Taylor. Um, that that mesh between design uh, between disciplines is such an immensely hard thing to navigate, especially if and when orgs are relying on the design system to be that catalyst versus recognizing it as more of a design or DevOps problem uh, or a culture problem and a system won't be the magic wand. So any advice on how to position these discussions back to particularly executive leadership to take pressure off the, just the design system or the design system team? I have thoughts, Chris. You want that? You want, you want that one first, or you want me to do that one first? No, dive in, dive in. Okay. So, first, first, I agree with the premise of the question, which is like the mesh between disciplines is not a design system problem, right? It's not just a design ops problem. It is an organizational problem, right? The the more the tighter your organization is, the better you're going to ship product, the better you're going to accomplish your goals. The more separate your design system is, or sorry, more separate your organization is, the harder it's going to be to do that. So I, I agree that the design system is not does not the onus does not fall on the design system team to do that. However, a lot of times nobody else is picking it up, right? So you see a piece of trash lying on the ground, you got to pick it up, right? You can't be like, ah, somebody else will do that. So a lot of times it does fall to the design system team by default, not because it's their job to be able to, to create or model that mesh. So a lot of times when I'm working with the design system team, I'm like, okay, well, why not us? Why not start it here? Um, and oftentimes what I'll do, and you know, this isn't, I say that I do this, but any team can do this without a consultant. They can, you can just do this on your own. You don't need a consultant to help you with this is model a small project where you're truly collaborating. You know, sometimes you do need a consultant or a third party just to be an objective facilitator. But if you can find an objective facilitator internally, that's even better. Um, Model a small project that really gets the team collaborating. And what comes out of that, the hypothesis, the bet that I always make on that is doing that activity, even for a week, you will get people more energized about work than they ever have been or have been in a long time. And out of that, you see buzz, and then you can share that buzz with leadership. So like constantly, every time, even if it's for a week, sometimes doing it for six weeks, however long you do this for, those Slack messages where people go, this is the most energized I've been at work for a long time. Take a screenshot of that and put it in a Google slide deck. Um, yep. the, 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 the DMs, or not the DMs, the, the chat messages back and forth somewhere, or you know, recordings of the Zoom call that you just had, or you know, whatever the the take a picture of something that somebody drew on the whiteboard about like, I love this team. You know, I like why don't we work this way all the time? There's always those kinds of sound bites that come out of this. You take that stuff, you collect it, you take that to leadership. And that's usually what gets buy-in. Um, we talked earlier about metrics and adoption and things like that. To me, one of the metrics that I look for to, to prove that a design system is, is doing well is retention retention. Like when teams who use the design system have higher retention than teams that don't, that is the major testimonial for the, for the efficacy of a design system. It's harder to track and it's usually a longer thing to track, but if you can track that, that's such, that's such a, a, a money saver. And it's such an important thing for an organization because retention is one of the most expensive things that organizations have to have to do. So if you can say, look, people that are using our design system are actually happier. They're having more fun at work. They're more likely to stick around. You, it, it becomes way more than just interface design consistency and things like that. So those are the things that I generally look for is like, get the team doing something fun, using the design system as a catalyst to do that. And once they do something fun, you'll see the buzz that comes out of that. And then you reflect that to leadership. You go, look, what, look what's happening over here. Do you want to invest in more of that? And leadership goes, absolutely, we want to. You know, And, and the conversations that you want to have typically come out of that. Yeah, a dear friend of mine, Robin Cannon, uh, is the head of design systems at, at J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, he talks about design systems as the Trojan horse for organizational change. And so, yeah, it's not the responsibility of the design systems team to do that necessarily, but it's a really great pathway because it is exciting when it works. Like it, it feels like nothing else. I, I was a rower in college. And when you would have those moments where everybody in the boat was stroking at exactly the same time, and it felt right, like that was a kind of miraculous feeling. And the best analog I have to that in, in my professional career is when everybody is using the same systems to build the same things. It feels really good. 
And there's kind of a high associated with it that's really awesome. And that's your Trojan horse that, that lets you in the door to kind of say like, yeah, no, we're doing the systems thing. But really what we're actually doing that we're going to kind of like put behind the curtain a little bit is we're going to actually change the way we work as a company. And that is a really, really powerful pipeline that that is very present inside of this. And I would look at that as like a cool opportunity. Um, you know, you could change the way a, a, a really big, meaningful company does business and builds product. Awesome. I think we have time for probably one more question here. Um, you know, Ashley is asking about tool bloat, right? Often feels like a challenge. It's, it's already hard to get the product and dev folks to use and embrace Figma and zero height workflows. And now they're looking at adding more cross-functional tools, storybook, chromatic, knapsack, that sort of space um, as we start to, to really pilot the system. Any thoughts on how to get non-designers interested and invested enough that you don't see it all as just a big hassle or uh, other ways to minimize or centralize tooling better? So you want to start, so, Chris? Yeah, let me dive into this one. So I, I think about this in two ways, right? So there's there's the way that that like you can manage at a smaller scale, right? Where it's like design has their set of tooling and their design system and engineering has their set of tooling and their design system. And then that like trickles down and meets at the product. And then somebody sorts that out and decide what actually goes into product and, and what doesn't. And that's like a multi-tool approach, right? Where that's like Storybook plus zero height, or that's like, you know, uh, uh, GitHub pages plus, you know, some, some like uh, rendering engine and some custom stuff, right? That works really well as long as you have a fairly small amount of people that you can manage um, uh, kind of in the palm of your hand, right? Like you have uh, uh, only a certain number and a certain level of scale. What happens is when you get into that bigger scale problem, the tooling actually causes more fragmentation than it solves at scale. And so you're kind of taking that fragmentation problem that you had before you had a system and you're kicking that can down the road. Now, in an end-to-end -to -end tool, like Knapsack in our case, um, the nice thing about that is you're actually reducing your tool count and you're trying to put more things into one place. Now, everybody can still work in the tools that are used to working in. Designers can still work in Figma. Engineers can still work in, in you know, whatever ID, VS Code. Um, but all of that has a common meeting place. And that meeting place becomes this really important like center of collaboration inside of the organization that then tries to, to basically reduce that friction and reduce that fragmentation into that central single system. I love Chris's answer. I'll, I'll just add one other piece to it then. Um, everything that Chris said, and then also, um, I think framing has a lot to do with it, with how you frame that change to an engineer, a designer, a product, you know, whoever it is that you're framing it to. Oftentimes when we ask for tool changes, it's usually, this is a tool that works best for me. I would like everyone else to basically deal with that. And it's like, well, who, <laughs> this pitch sucks. <laughs> this is an awful pitch. Yeah, it um, has to be the path of least. Path yeah, it's like, least. totally. So, but it's a totally different pitch if if it's basically, hey, I would like, I would like you to try this thing because I think it makes your work easier and my work easier, and I will take away all of the risk of you adopting that new tool. Because a lot of times, why people don't adopt new tools is is risk. There's risk to it. So for an engineer to adopt new tool, well, they're already too busy. They already are overbooked. They're already over. Now they have to learn a new tool. Now they have to some unknown learning curve on top of that. And if they don't do a good job, they get fired or laid off or you know like. It's too much risk in that. No, thanks. I'll just stick to my tools right now. So, you know, a lot of times, again, there, there's a difference. A lot of times when I work with designers, there's a difference between saying to designers, hey, we're, we're having a new workflow now. You got to use Git. Like that terrifies the pants off some designers. So instead of, of saying it like that, the way that I frame it is, hey, designers, can we spend a week and I'll teach you Git? And we're going to try it on a small project. And it's okay if, it, if, if you mess up, it's fine. That's what this week is for. I'm like, oh, that's, that's cool. Like, because the risk has gone away and then someone is there to support them in this new thing and they have space and they have the time and there's no risk and they won't get fired. You know, all of that stuff happens there. Um, so I think that's the, that's part of the adoption path to a new tool is you've got to figure out, you identify what the risk is for the other person and then find some way to, to remove that risk. It, is there a trial period that they can go through? Like, is there a way that they have some semblance of control in this decision as opposed to it being placed on them? If it's being placed on them, there's usually a lot of, a lot of resistance to it. Um, if they have some agency in like how we do it or when we use this tool, or can we do it on the next project instead of this one? Or can we try a side-by-side -side comparison? Of so like all of those things are ways that you can alleviate risk for someone. And I find a, a lot of people are, are much more uh, reticent to adopt a new tool if, if there's less risk in it for them. Awesome answer.
Awesome. Well, hey, Dan, thanks again. Really appreciate it. Uh, you know, thank you to everybody for attending. It's been great to chat. Um, we'll be posting a recording of this. Uh, and um, if you have any additional questions, feel free to shout out hello at knapsack.cloud. Andrew, did you have any other wrap-up stuff? You just nailed it. i um, happy to keep the conversation going. I know there's some other pieces, um, some questions in there. So yeah, reach out to us. We are clearly always very happy to get on soapboxes and talk shop. So looking forward to hearing from more of you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.